All right, so the recorder is on and audio is good. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, today's topic is going to be transitioning, not with this stuff here, because we're not teaching Node.js in this class, even though it's really useful. Uh, let's see, where's this class? Here we go. There we go. All right, so we are going to transition to talk about floating point number representation. This is something that we started before exam one. And what we'll do today is kind of start from scratch, okay? Start from the very beginning of this entire module, and then we'll see if there are any questions. So to some of you, there may be some repetition from before exam one, which was more, you know, exactly last week, last Monday. Um, so hopefully you have a little bit more time to absorb the concept and then we'll talk about it today. All right, so the first thing is um, I don't have to explain the representation or how the binary digits, the bits are being used because Wikipedia does a pretty good job with that already. And the most important part is the picture right here. So this is a picture of how the binary digits or the bits are being utilized in a double precision floating point number. It is called double because you know, there's a single as well. There's a single precision floating point number that only makes use of 32 bits. This one makes use of 64 bits and that's why it's called a double or double precision floating point number. Um, we'll start with a discussion you know, on base 10 scientific notation and then we'll transition to a binary floating point number representation, and then we'll get back to this picture of how do we spread out the zeros and ones, you know, you know, over a 64-bit uh, double precision floating point number. So we'll get back to this page after an example. So we'll go back to the spreadsheet, I mean, uh, the tablet, and uh, this time I'm, you know, kind of experimenting with a grid, you know, type of design. So you guys can tell me whether it works better than the you know, kind of like a blank page or not. So what, what we'll do is we're going to start with um, something that is that you that you know like 216.625 in base 10. And we kind of know what is this value, right? 216 and uh, 6, 0.625. The question is how do we express this using the base 10 scientific notations. That's the first thing we want to do, is to introduce the scientific notation, but in base 10. Okay, that's actually really easy. All we need to do is to say times 10 to the power of zero. What is any number to the power of zero? It's one, right? So that means, you know, if I want to express a value using what we call a coefficient, this part is called a coefficient, coefficient. And then this part here is called, you know, this specific part is the exponent. Okay, it is the exponent of 10 in this case because we're dealing with base 10 numbers. So a floating point number or a scientific notation is essentially that, okay? A value is specified by two things. The first one is the coefficient, and then the second one is the exponent of the base that we're dealing with. And since we're dealing with base 10 right now, so we are raising 10 to the power of something. And that exponent, you know, basically is responsible to control the magnitude of the number. Is, is that okay? Does everybody understand what I just said? Okay, all right. <clears throat> but the same thing can also be rewritten in a slightly different way. So this whole thing, okay, is also 21 point 6625 times 10 to the power of 1. Are you convinced of that? That these two are essentially the same thing? Because I can divide the coefficient by 10, and then I can multiply you know, 10 to the entire thing. Except you don't see the multiplication by 10, because all I have to do is to raise the power of 10 by 1. That is equivalent to multiplying the whole thing by 10. So is that okay? Is everybody kind of comfortable with exponent math. Okay, cool. I can do it one more time. So now th this time we have 2.16625 times 10 to the power of 1. 
Um, yep. Okay. Times ten to the power of what? Two. Very good. All right. So, what is the whole point of doing this? Well, the whole point of doing this is we want our coefficient to be "quote unquote" normalized. In other words, when the coefficient meets a certain requirement, it becomes your know, mantissa. A mantissa is a coefficient when the coefficient meets certain constraints. So, what constraints are we talking about? We are looking at the coefficient. It has to be greater than or equal to one. It also has to be less than whatever base we're dealing with. In this case, it is base ten. So whenever the coefficient is greater than or equal to one, but less than ten, because we're dealing with, with base ten, it is also called the mantissa. You can also look at the mantissa as a normalized coefficient. That's one way to look at it as well. Are we okay with the terminology? So we have coefficient. Yes, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. So the mantissa, so when this happens, then the coefficient, oops, I cannot spell, then the coefficient is also known as the mantissa. Mantissa. That's all. Yep. Are you also recording? Yes, I believe so. Yep, we are definitely recording. Thank you for checking. All right. So we got three terms. In, three terms introduced at this point. We have the coefficient, we have the exponent, and then we also have the mantissa, which is really the coefficient, but it has to meet the requirement of being greater than or equal to one, but less than ten in this case, because we're dealing with base ten numbers. Is that good so far? Okay. So if you're writing this constant in C or C++, you can express this one as 2.16625 E2. Okay, this is a C notation. I hope you had a chance to talk about, um, I mean, the professor had, a, had some time to talk about this double precision floating point number and also the float or the um, scientific notation in CISP 360. Um, is that the case? Do you guys remember, at least vaguely, that the base 10 scientific notation was discussed in CISP 360? So I see some nodding. Okay, Is there anyone here who did not get exposed to this notation? Okay. Okay. So I guess it depends on whom you take that class from. <clears throat> All right. But... Is that okay now? I mean, am I sufficiently explaining what this notation actually means in terms of what value is being expressed? Okay, all right. So that's base 10. What I'll do next is to look at base 2. And we're going to focus on exactly the same value, which is 216.625 in base 10. The first thing we need to do is to convert it into base 2. So base conversion is something that we have talked about several weeks ago. Okay, there's a certain equation that you can use to uh, to convert. Uh, well, I shouldn't say convert, but to express a value in a specific base. Okay, so you can use that equation if you want to. The equation looks like this. Okay, d of i is the floor of whatever value you want to convert into base whatever b is to the power of i. And then the whole thing mod whatever base is. B is the base. D is the value that I want to express in base B. And D of I is digit I. This should not be anything new. Okay, if you look at this equation and you go like, Tak, haven't you talked about this like many times already? The answer is yes. I have mentioned this many times. But this is one of the occasions where it is applicable because you can now use it to express the value um, which is 216.625 in base 10. So that's one way to do it, okay? You know, using that equation is one way to do it. But most of the time in base 2, you can also do it in a much more intuitive way, which is to express the value, which is 216.625, in a sum of non-recurring powers of 2. What does that mean? Okay, it's a sum, which means we're adding stuff. What are we adding? Powers of 2. So what, what about that 
qualification of non-recurring. Each power of two can only happen once or none. Okay, they cannot occur more than once. So with 216.625, I can now say, hmm, let me see if I can re-express it as a sum of powers of two, and we do not reuse the same power of two. In other words, each power of two can only have zero or one occurrence. All right, so the first way we start with is, let's say 256, which is two to the power of eight. Yeah, I don't think we have those because 216 is less than 256. So <clears throat> we'll start with, with the 128. Once we take care of the 128, I think there's still a 64 in it. So we put the 64 here. That would take care of 192, which means there should not be a 32. Let me check, because I have to do my arithmetic in my head. Okay, 196, and then we have 216 to do the subtraction. So we got a zero. I think if this is a two, say so the four here, and there's a two. So that is correct. We don't have a 32, but we do have a 16. And then we have an eight. And that should take care of all the non-fractional powers of two. Okay? So I'm gonna do a quick sanity check to see whether this is right or not. So the four plus the six, well, let me kind of point to the whole thing here. So this 4 plus the 6 is a 0, you know, it ends with a 0, and then the 8 plus the 8 ends with a 6. So the quick sanity check you know, tells me that, yeah, I'm probably right. Okay, just by looking at the least significant digit of the sum, it matches what I want. And because the restriction is, you know, I can only use powers of 2, I'm fairly sure this is, you know, correct. But if you're not sure, okay, you can always just kind of add it up. So we got 128, 64, 16, and an 8. Um, so then 26 over here. So we have 2, 6, 2, which is a 10. So that's 11. And then we have 2 over here. So yes, so we got 216 back. So that will take care of the 216. What about the 6.625? Can we express that as a sum of powers of 2? The answer is yes, because the power can go negative. 2 to the power of negative 1 is 0.5, or 1 half. Uh, 2 to the power of negative 2 is 1 fourth, a quarter, which is also 0.25, right? And then 2 to the power of negative 3 is 0.125, or an eighth, okay? So we can express that too. So now we can say, oh, okay, there's a 0.5, and then after the 0.5, we have a 0.125. And then the next thing we need to do is to re-express all of these decimal value into binary numbers, okay? Two to, I mean, 128 is two to the power of seven, so that means in, in base two, it is seven zeros with a one all the way to the left-hand side. And the way I usually do this, since this is all kinda, it's a grid, we can put a one here and then just say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in base two, 64 is 2 to the power of, no, <laughs> 6, okay, it's 2 to the power of 6, so that means we have 1 followed by 6 zeros, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, and then 16 is 1 to the power, is 2 to the power of 4, so that means we have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 1 over here, 8 is going to be like this, and then the point 0.5 is on the other side. So the point 0.5 means you know, there's a point here. The point 0.5 is a 1 over here. The quarter is a 0. And then the uh, eighth is, okay, I should probably do it like this. This is the eighth. In other words, the number of positions to the right-hand side of the decimal point, that number corresponds to the... Um, how far on the negative side the power is. So 2 to the power of negative 1 is one place over on the right-hand side of the dot. 1 eighth, which is 2 to the power of negative 3, is negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. Three places to the right-hand side of the point. So we're doing okay so far with the notations. Okay. Now, to be correct, I also have to emphasize that everything here 
are expressed in base two because otherwise, you know, I'll be expressing one thousand here, or I'll be expressing one followed by three zeros in base two. So I have to emphasize that we are dealing with base two here. So when you add when you add all of these together, then you end up with a one zero one on the right hand side of the decimal point, and then we have three zeros followed by a one one a zero another one one over here. And that's a base two number. So now we have a base two representation of exactly the same value that we started off with, also in the previous slide. Are we doing okay so far? Everything on this page should be seen as a review, okay? Because we have done base conversion already. So this part has nothing to do with um, the floating point number representation. Is that okay? All right. So what we're going to do next is to say, hmm, okay, we'll do the same trick here. Because we're dealing with base two, then we convert this into a scientific notation in base two just by multiplying the entire coefficient or the entire value itself by two to the power of zero, because two to the power of zero, just like 10 to the power of zero, is just one. And you can always multiply something by one and pre preserve the value. So right here, we already have a base two scientific notation because we have the coefficient and then we have the exponent, except everything is in base two. Are there, are, there, are there any questions at this point? Okay, so can you guys all understand the parallel between this particular slide and the slide before this? Okay, all right. So then what we, what we do next is to do exactly the same thing, which means, you know, we want to move, okay, we want to move this binary point. I'm not going to call it a decimal point because we're dealing with, dealing with binary numbers. We want to move this all the way over here. So I'm going to skip a whole bunch of steps because I think we probably know what to do in this case. Okay. So the question is, what power up to should I have now? now that I have shifted the decimal point so many places to the left. Yep. Negative seven. Negative seven. Why would it be negative? Uh, because we're shifting it, the decimal point forward so that the binary, so that the decimal, or so we're not supposed to use decimal, but. Binary. Binary, yeah, we're shifting it to the left. So therefore, um, we would need the decimal to move left. But every time you move the binary point to the left, you are dividing the coefficient by two, which means to make up for the division by two, what do you do? You have to up the exponent of two by one. So you're correct. You count the number of times you ha we have to do it, but the correction is increasing the power of two and not decreasing the power of two. Is that okay? All right. So there's another way to look at this, which I'll talk about next. So the point is, we have to move the point one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. So as a result, we put a seven as the new exponent of two. So the other way to look at this, okay, if you want a quick intuitive sanity check of the concept, is to basically think about what this one is representing. This one here is representing this one of two to the power of seven, because you know, that is, it is um, seven places to the left-hand side of the point here. Then you look at this one here and you ask again, what is that representing? It's one point something, one point blah, 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 times two to the power of seven. So this one here is still representing that we have one of two to the power of seven. So that's a quick sanity check to see if whether we should increase the power of two or decrease the power of two, depending on how many places we have to move the binary point over to the left. Is that okay? So I'm trying to relate multiple concepts or multiple pathway to look at these two representations and also at the same time do a quick sanity check, you know, in terms of math to see whether we moved the exponent in the right direction or not. All right, are we still good? Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, 
that's about it. Okay, so we have already talked about the base two、uh, scientific notation. So once again, this part here, as it is right now, it qualifies as the mantissa. Because remember, the mantissa is really the coefficient, but it has to satisfy two requirements. It has to be greater than or equal to one. Do we all agree that one point blah 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 is greater than or equal to one, regardless of the base? Okay. The second one is it has to be less than whatever the base is. So now we have to look at this number and ask: Is it less than two? The value two. The answer is yes. Because two is expressed as one zero in base two, which means you know, this number is definitely less than one zero because you know, we have a zero as the most significant digit or digit one over here. So whatever this thing is, is definitely less than two. So it has met both the both of the requirements in order for a coefficient to also be called a mantissa. So now we have a mantissa. The exponent. Is still here, okay? So this is still our exponent, except this time it is the exponent of two and not the exponent of ten because we're dealing with base two representation and not a base ten representation anymore. So we're still doing okay so far in terms of the concept and how we translated concepts in a base ten scientific notation to a base two scientific notation. We good so far? Okay, all right. So I think we're ready to go back to Wikipedia and take a look at this picture. I like this picture because it's color coded. So either of these expressions will tell you what value is being expressed by the 64-bit tab. Okay. So what we need to do now is to read or try to read what these you know, expressions are trying to tell us. And I can tell you that you already know how to read. Either one of these representation or either one of these expressions, I would say the second one is probably closer to what we have already done or what we have already、uh, expressed up to this point. So I'm just magnifying a little bit here, so it's easier to see the second expression here. All right. So the first thing is the sine bit, which is bit sixty three, is a single digit, is a single binary digit. The only way we make use of that one bit is to raise. Negative one to the power of the sine. So, what is negative one to the power of zero? One. It's a one, okay. And what about negative one to the power of one? one? Is what is negative one to the power of one? Negative one. Negative one. That's right, because any value raised to the power of one is that original value. So that is how we control the sine of the overall number. Is when the sine bit is a zero, it is non-negative. When the sine bit is a one, then the whole value is negative. Is that okay? All right. So the sine bit is usually not a big deal, because that's all it is. Okay. If it's a one, then the value is negative. If it's zero, if it is a zero, then the value is not negative. It is non-negative. So what is in the parentheses right here? That looks a little cryptic. But at the same time, it doesn't look too foreign either. I hope it doesn't look too foreign. The one plus is always going to be here, which means this one is not stored as a single bit within the 64-bit double precision floating point number. This one that we add to the sigma notation is always there. Is that okay? I, I will explain why that is the case, but we'll just kind of go like, okay, so we have a one plus always be, always being there. What about the sigma? The sigma is really a very slightly modified version of how we look at the value of an unsigned binary number. It is a sigma. So how? Okay, this is a trick. Okay, I'm going to teach you. How do you interpret a sigma notation like this? You plug in the values. Okay, you plug in the start of the range of the value, and then you plug in the end of the range of the value, so that you can tell when. I is a one. What are we multiplying? When I is fifty-two, what are we multiplying? Because in between, you just get everything that is kind of sequentially you know, related to each other. Okay, so we'll do that trick. What if I equals to one? Then we have b of fifty-one times two to the power of negative one. What does that mean? It means this digit here, where the my mouse pointer is, is telling us how many halves do we have. 
but I should say how many half do we have? Because you can either have zero or one half. You cannot have more than that. Does that make sense? Does everybody understand what I just said? The bit that the little mouse pointer is pointing at is telling us whether we have zero of a half or one of a half. Okay? And then this is how many quarters do we have? How many eighths do we have? And so on. So when you go all the way down to this number here, that means you know, we are looking at, am I right? Yeah, I'm right. Okay, so when i equals to 52, what do we end up with? b of 0, because i is 52, so we are looking at b0, which is the least significant digit of the entire thing. But what are we multiplying to bit b0? 2 to the power of negative 52. Okay, are we still okay at this point? Okay, all right, so this, whatever is in the parentheses, is guaranteed to be greater than or equal to 1. Is that obvious? It's 1 plus a bunch of non-zero values or non-negative values. So I think we are fairly sure that whatever is in the parentheses has to be greater than or equal to 1. Are we good so far? But I can also tell you it has to be less than 2. Why is it less than 2? Because the first term, the largest term of the sigma, is a half. The second largest term is a quarter. The third largest term is an eighth, and so on. So when you add up all of those terms, it will come close to a 1, but it can never get to 1. Okay? So in other words, we have 1 plus, and then the sigma term by itself can only be close to 1, but not quite. So that means the entire sum inside the parentheses has to be less than 2. Wait. I think we mentioned that term before, right? Something that's greater than or equal to 1, but less than 2 because we have base 2. What is that thing again? Mantisa. It's called the mantissa, okay? So the mantissa is specified like this. And then we have 2 to the power of e minus 1023. What, e, what is e? E is the green portion. So when you look at bit 52 to bit 62, you treat those 11 bits as an unsigned integer. Okay? You treat those 11 bits as an unsigned integer. We call that e. But what you raise the raise 2 to the power of, the power of 2, is not e itself. It is e minus 1,023. The 1,023 is called a bias. e itself is called a biased exponent. The unbiased exponent is e minus whatever the bias amount is. All right, so are we doing okay so far with all this discussion? Okay, so technically speaking, this is all we need to know technically about the double precision floating point number. Okay, but I think at this point, things are pretty abstract, right? You know, I just talked about a bunch of you know, representations, but you know, I think it might be helpful to do a conversion. So we can start with a base 10 representation, we convert it into the double precision floating point number, and then we make sure that it is the correct representation. That's what we're gonna do next. But before we go there, we're gonna take row first, okay? Because we want to have a slight transitional period. And today's row is right here already. I just have to unhide it, publish. And the access code is exponent, E-X-P-O-N-E-N-T. And I think the time is fine. Yep, we got 15 minutes to do it. So I'll just write it on the whiteboard here. It is exponent. There we go. That's our access code for the road taking activity. And then I am going back to the Wikipedia page. Right. Does anyone need more time for the road taking activity or are we good with that?
Okay, we are, I'm guessing we're good with it. All right. All right. So what we'll do next is we'll do our conversion. We will go back to the this slide here, and then the question is, how do we represent what we know as in base ten two hundred and sixteen point six two five as a base two double precision floating point number? That's what that's what we want to know. So in order to do that, I'm going to do something that's relatively lazy because I got all this figure out already. So I'm going to copy and paste this. Okay, so I will do a copy and paste it to the new slide over here. And then we'll start with this. Okay. All right. First thing first, okay, there are a few things that are really easy to do. The first part is where is the fractional part of the mantissa? The fractional part of the mantissa in the actual representation is the pink portion, okay, or salmon or coral or however you want to call that, peach. So this portion here is really the same thing as this portion over here. So all I need to do now is to go to my marker and select a color that is matching. Unfortunately, I don't have exactly that color and it looks like I can't really create a new color. So I'm just, oops, I'm just gonna pick you know, um, kind of the purple color here and call that the same thing as red. There we go. So now we got the pink portion all figured out already. It starts with one and then the rest is zero, one, one, zero, 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 one, zero, and then one, zero, one, and then a whole bunch of zeros after that. Is that okay? Next question. What is the sign? The sign is pretty easy. Does, should I use zero as the sign bit or should I use one as the sign bit? Is the value that we are trying to represent negative or not? It is, it's not negative, so that means what should be, should be what should be the sign bit? A zero. Very good. Okay, so we got most of it figured out already. Easy peasy, right? So the only thing we haven't figured out is what about the biased exponent? Okay, we know the unbiased exponent is what we have here as the seven. Okay, that's the unbiased exponent. So I, I will write it very clear here: the unbiased exponent exponent okay it's seven so what should be the biased exponent in other words I'm asking what minus 1023 is seven because we want seven to be the same thing as e minus 1023 so using your algebra what should be e 1,030, very good, okay, so E is 1,030, and we want to express this as a unsigned 11-bit integer. How do we do that? Same trick, okay, we want to express it as a sum of non-recurring powers of 2, okay? So how do we do this? <clears throat> well, I think it has a 1,024 in it, then we have 6 left. 6 is easy, it's, it's, uh, 6 is 4 plus 2, so, hey, come on, erase, there we go, so we have a 4, a 2, okay, that looks about right to me, so now we have 1 followed by 10 zeros, because 1024 is 2 to the power of 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and then we have a 4, which is a 1, 0, 0, then we have a 2, which is a 1, 0. Add up all these, you get 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and a 1 here. So this 11 bit pattern, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, is the binary representation of the biased exponent. Do we have any questions about? that portion, how we came up with the biased exponent. 
Okay. All right, very good. So assuming we don't have any questions here, then we go back to the picture and ask, which portion here is the biased exponent? Tell me the color. Which portion is the biased exponent? The green portion, OK? So the green portion here has 11 bits. It is the biased exponent. And the biased exponent, which is also E here, you have to subtract 1,023 from it to become the actual exponent of 2 that we multiply to the mantissa. So now we go back here, and then we color code it too. So if we go to the marker tool, and I do have green. I'm not sure whether it's light green or not, but it should be close enough. So we figure out the green portion. now. This is the green portion. We also have the blue portion figure out. That's the sign bit. So I'm going to go you know, highlight the sign bit too. And that's a, I'm going to pick this one, kind of really light blue. And this is the sign. OK. Are we still doing OK so far? I know it's harder for you to kind of include color coding when you're taking notes. So you can instead kind of make a note of the time you know, when we got all of the colors you'll figure out, because you, know, you might want to refer back to this picture. If you're not writing, if you're not taking notes, I would be worrying for you. OK, so I can see most people are you know, taking down some taking notes of some kind, which is good. All right, so now what do we do? I hate to say it this way because it's, it's, it, it looks kind of, sounds kind of bad. We do what, uh, what Avengers do. We assemble. <laughs> we have all the bits already. We just have to figure out, okay, Captain America, you go over here. Iron Man, you go here. And then Hulk, the Hulk, you go over there. Okay? You know, because we got all the members, we got all the individual bits all figured out already. It's just a matter of uh, who goes where. Okay? So now we look at this picture, and we look at the other picture. We look at this picture here and go like, oh, okay. So the sign bid, you go all the way to bit 63. Uh, the green portion, which is the biased exponent, you're right next to it. And then the rest would be the pink portion. Okay, so we'll go back to this slide here, and then we'll assemble the whole thing. And I'm going to try something here. Okay, so okay, so what I'll do is I will, oh, okay, it's not using the lasso tool. Now should be using the lasso tool. Yep, there we go. Okay, so it doesn't, it's not lassoing just the portion that I want. There we go. And then we bring a copy of this. And we just say, let's put you over here. And then next we have the mantisa, not the mantisa, we have the exponent. So we use the lasso tool again. And this time we look at, it's not working yet. Come on, lasso, there we go. So this time we look at this portion of the number, and once again we make a copy, and then hmm, it's not making a copy, is it? Okay, undo. Let's do that one more time. It's still including the bar, the line over it, which is not what I want. Oh, okay. I guess it's fine. Deal. We'll we'll deal with it because it's not uh it's not copying. It's actually just moving. I'm not using the tool correctly. Um. Oh, because I copy but I didn't paste, so it's not a duplicate function. It's okay. We can we can then use it here, and this time it will be correct. This is the fractional part of the mantissa. So let me do that one more time. This is the fractional part of the mantissa. We don't want the one point, okay? The one point is not a part of the fractional part of the mantissa. It's whatever is to the right-hand side of the point. That is the fractional part. So this time I will do it right, okay? Copy and then paste. And then copy this all the way to this portion here. Okay, 
almost done because you know, we still need a whole bunch of zeros after that. So we'll just say, eh, we just have a bunch of zeros all the way down to bit zero. This is the base 64, or not base 64, this is the 64 bit double precision floating point number. Okay. Are we doing okay so far? Yep. Where did you get the 1,223 from? That's the, I, I, okay. So the honest thing to say is I just copied it from here. Hmm? It's always that it is determined by the IEEE. So I did not get a say in this. <laughs> because if I did, I would have said, let's use an 11-bit signed representation of the exponent. But you know, IEEE did not agree with that. And you know, this, is, this, this is the standard. I cannot just you know, say, I want to use the bits in this particular way. But the 1,023 is the bias. And that's always going to be 1,023. All right, so we go back to the picture that we have been drawing here, and then we'll go ahead and highlight the last portion, you know, the bunch of zeros that we do not want to write because, you know, there's a whole bunch of zeros here. So I'm just, you know, using a bit of, little bit of those. All right, what is next? Okay, because Tab just made a claim. I just claimed that in order to represent two... 116.625 in base 10, these are the zeros and ones that you should use to represent that. So you're going to say, um, I'm not so sure. Can you prove it? Can you ver at least verify that this is the bit pattern to represent 216.625? That would be a very good question to ask, okay? Because I want to double check too. So the way we're going to do that is to do a conversion into base 16 first, okay? So we are dealing with hexadecimal numbers now. So in hexadecimal, I need to go find a place on the screen that is large enough for all of those digits, but I think this will work. Um, let me see, okay, we'll, we'll put it here. So the bit pattern of zero, 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 is just zero in hexadecimal. Zero, 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 one is just one. 0, 0, 1, 0 is 2, 0, 0, 1, 1 is 3, 0, 0, oops, take it back, 0, 1, 0, 0 is 4, 0, 1, 0, 1 is 5, 0, 1, 1, 0 is 6, 0, 1, 1, 1 is 7, 0, oops, I'll take it back again because I kept forgetting to advance to the next digit. This is 8. This is naturally 9. All right. So we still have a few more uh, binary bit patterns to go, but we have already exhausted all the base 10 digits because in base 10, you only got digit 0 to digit 9. That's all. So now the question is, we have six more bit patterns. What are we going to do with those six bit patterns? The six bit patterns would be 1010, and then finally 1111. So there are these six bit patterns where we go like, um, I think we are running out of digits. That's okay. We'll borrow letters from the English alphabet. So we're going to borrow A to F to represent these six additional bit patterns. So now we have A, B, C, D, E, and finally F. So on one side, we have the binary representation. On the other side, we have the hexadecimal digits. I only put hex here because that's usually how people refer to hexadecimal, which is base 16. It is hexadecimal is base 16 because hexa is a 6 and then deci is a 10. So when you combine the hexa and the deci, you have 16. So that's why we have hexadecimal digits, which is in base 16. And base 16 is used a lot. Okay. Um, I can take a look at my, where's my, uh, hmm. any type of networking equipment 
we have a MAC address, and the MAC address is usually expressed in hexadecimal digits. When you look at a Bluetooth device, it also has its own unique address. It is also in hexadecimal digits because it is the most convenient way to convert a bunch of zeros and ones as concisely as possible into much shorter, a much shorter representation. What about base 10? Isn't base 10 great too? Sort of, okay? Because the conversion between base two and base 10 is messy, okay? It involves, okay, let's see, from base two to base 10 at least involves multiplication and bunch of addition and stuff like that, which you cannot do mentally easily. But the conversion between base two and base 16 is easy. It's table lookup, that's all you're doing. You're just looking up a table. If I see this hexadecimal digit, it corresponds to these four digits. If I see these four binary digits, it corresponds to that hexadecimal digit. It's as simple as that. So that means now I can convert the uh, binary representation here into hexadecimal because that makes it easier for me to type it in when I get into a debugger to illustrate um, that the conversion actually does work in this case. So the way to do this is to group the binary digits, the bits, in groups of four. That's the first thing we need to do. And so we look at, okay, that's a four, 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 group of four, group of four, group of four, and then the rest, we'll just have to figure out how many groups of four of zeros we have you know, as the leftover. So now the next thing we need to do is to look it up, literally, just look up. 0, 1, 0, 0 is corresponding to which hexadecimal digit? Four. Okay, very good. And then 0, 0, 0, 0, I think that one is pretty easy. 0, 1, 1, 0 is a, is a 6. <laughs> it's a 6. It's right here, okay? So you can make a slightly better version of the conversion table. I mean, this one is really kind of ugly. You know, penmanship is, my penmanship is not good. Uh, 1011 is a B, okay, very good. And then we have a one here and that's a four, okay. And the rest are all zeros. The question is how many zeros do I need? Okay, that's my question. How do you figure out how many zeros do I need to specify 16 4 bits all together? Okay, so what information do you need? What knowledge do you need? So when you're, when you're trying to solve a problem, the first thing is what type of knowledge, what type, what type of fact do I need to know? Well, the first thing is I need to know how many zeros and ones do I need as a total? How many? 64, 64 of those, okay, very good. Uh, we have already specified one, two, three, four, five, six in hexadecimal. So how many bits have we already specified? 24. So we have, what, 40 left, right? So we have 40 binary digits left. So how many hexadecimal zeros do I need to specify 40 zeros in binary? 10, exactly, because one zero in hexadecimal specifies four zeros in base two. How do we know that? The table, <laughs> okay? So at this point, the table is the, I mean, you don't even need to know base conversion, the, the, the conventional base conversion, because right now, it's just lookup. So we'll just say, you know, 10 times zeros over here, okay? All right. So that's my claim. How do you know this actually is representing the value of 216.625? All right, so this is the fun part. Let me take a look at the time. We got plenty of time for this. So the way we do this is let me switch to a terminal first, okay, because I can show you the program. There we go. All right, so we're gonna, eh, the temp folder is fine. We are going to write a very simple program. We call it simple. It's already done because of last Thursday's class. So you look at this program, there are a few things that you may not recognize. I would doubt that anyone know about standard integer.h, which is stdint.h, okay? Standard integer.h. 
it is a header file that predefines a bunch of names, such as uint64 underscore t. So normally, if you want to specify an integer type that is unsigned, but it uses 64 bits, you kind of have to guess, okay? Because you know, it varies between the platforms. If you're, if you're programming on a 32-bit platform, um, a long int, long unsigned is probably only 32-bit wide. But if you're working on a 64-bit platform, an unsigned by itself may be 64-bit wide already. So that means, you know, if you want to use a certain width for an integer, you may not know how to specify it right off the bat. This takes that mystery out, okay? Because whenever you say u in 64 underscore t by including standard integer.h, regardless of what platform you're on, regardless of the C compiler, regardless of your host system and your target system and all kinds of things that can affect the width of an integer, it's guaranteed to be 64 bit. Okay, so this is one way for us to know for sure that x is an integer, it is unsigned, and it is 64-bit wide. This is not typically something they teach in CISP 360, but nonetheless, it is just as important as some of most of the other concepts that you learned in CISP 360. So you can see the program doesn't actually do anything, right? I mean, it just put a value of 0 into x, and it returns right away. It doesn't seem to have anything to do with what we are trying to explain today. But that's okay, because you know, what we do is we're just going to compile the program. Okay, this is how I compile programs using the command line. In fact, you know, if you give me VS Code, you know, uh, Visual Studio you know, Code, I wouldn't be very good at it. Okay, I can figure out how to get things done eventually, but I wouldn't be able to get around you know, as quickly as most people can. But I'm really used to simple tools on the command line. All right, so we now run the program. But instead of running the program, I'm going to use GDB to debug the program. Um, hmm. Okay, that's okay. That's fine. It's all working. And L means list, and I can now put a breakpoint on line eight. So that means you know when I run the program, it will run all the way up to but excluding line eight. It will stop right there before the return. Okay. So I'm going to run the program. R is run. And now it has stopped or paused on line 8. So right now I can say, hmm, I have a local variable x. I wonder what value it has. What do you think it has? According to the program, you can still see it on line 7. It should be 0, right? I mean, what, what else can it possibly be? Okay. So what we do now is we are going to overlay the tablet behind it. Okay. So th this way I can see the tablet while being able to look at the code here. So what I'll do is I'm going to, in the debugger, this is not even in the program itself, in the debugger, I use you know, set var, which is set the value of a variable, uh, x equals to 0x. Zero 0x zero is the prefix in C and C++ to specify a hexadecimal number. So whatever after the 0x is interpreted as a base 16 number. So now I can specify Okay, 406, B14, and then 10 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There we go. All right, so we press the Enter key. We look at X again, and it's like this you know, gigantic number here, because this is the base 10 representation of you know, the hexadecimal 406B14 followed by 10 zeros. In other words, that's not you know 216 point something because all we are doing is we are still looking at the 64 bit bit pattern as an unsigned 64 bit number are we doing okay so far with that statement yes can you say it again we are still looking at the 64 bit over here as a 64 bit unsigned integer which means this tells us how many ones we have. This tells us how many twos, uh, this, how many ones, how many twos, four, eight, and so on. And this over here is telling you, telling us how many two to the power of sixty threes do we have. And that ends up as this particular value if we choose to interpret the binary digits in that way. Okay, but that's not what I want to do, right? You know, I want to show you if I interpret these bits as 
the sine bit, the unsigned, the, uh, the biased you know, exponent, and also the fractional part of the mantissa, if I want to look at these zeros and ones in that particular way, then I should get back 216.625. The question is, how do we do that? You have learned all the tools to do already, but you may not know how to combine those tools. So the first thing we try is, oh, I think it's casting, right? Because casting means you know, we are uh, converting from one type to another type. They have to both be similar in nature. In other words, in this case, x is representing a value, a numerical value. A double can also be used to represent a value. But if I press the Enter key, it doesn't get the job done. The reason why it's not getting, job, getting the job done is by the time the double type cast operator is encountered, x is already interpreted as a 64-bit unsigned integer. So all we are doing is to look at that very same value that we printed before and say, oh, now look at it as a double. And that's why it gave you the, that's why it gave you the mantissa and the exponent. Because that's typically how a double is represented. All right? So it's not getting the job done. So how do, we, how do we get this done? So as it turns out, let me... Okay, so I want to see if you guys know what this is. What is that? What is the Empress and as an operator doing in a C++ statement or state, uh, address. expression? Address of, right? So now we have the address of X, okay? And it's some kind of mumbo jumbo, okay? Because you know, it is a 64-bit address, and you know, there are 16 digits, typically, but there may be some leading zeros, so that's why it's not exactly 16. So this is where we can find the variable x in the program. And it is a pointer, or the address of, a un64 underscore t. That's kind of what we expected because the address of a unsigned 64-bit integer is the address of a 64-bit unsigned you know, integer. Okay, that's, there's no mystery in this, right? Okay, so we then, we look at this again, but this time I use this cast operator. What am I doing here? What is the type cast operator doing in this particular case? Well, first of all, what is double with an asterisk after that? It's the pointer or the address to a double. Very good. So what I'm doing now is to say, okay, I'm still starting with the address of X, which was the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer. Then the typecast operator is now saying, wait, 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 wait. Don't look at this as a as the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer. Instead, look at it as the address of a double. So suddenly, the address of x is no longer, quote-unquote, the address of a 64-bit unsigned integer. It is now the address of a double. Are we good? And then what we look at this, and it's like, oh, but, but tag, it hasn't changed anything. Look at the address. It has not changed. Of course, the address has not changed. I have only changed how to interpret that address. What is the meaning of the address? That's what the operator has changed, not the address itself. But now, if I do a dereference, the dereference operator, which is the single asterisk, is now saying, um, okay, I see that you're giving me an address and ask me what is at the address, but this time it will look at the zeros and ones, the 64 zeros and ones at the address as a double because I casted the address first before I dereference the address. All right, so I'm going to pause here and see if there are questions. Because these are the concepts that you have learned already in CISP 360, except you may not have seen the application of those you know, operators in this particular way. In fact, I'm pretty sure you have not. <laughs> you can kind of see you know, why C and C++ is a is not a really simple programming language because you, you can I mean you can have taken CISP 430 okay in other words all the actual programming classes you might have taken all of the programming classes 
and still not have encountered something like this. All right, so we press the enter key and go like, oh, okay, we get our 216.625 back. Yay. All right, so I'm going to pause here, take a really long pause, and see if there are any questions about the material that we have talked about so far. Or is there anything you want me to show you? Anything you want me to demonstrate? Because we can go in the opposite direction. No questions? I have a question. What, what if we want to represent negative 216.625? What should I do to x? Yep. Oh, to x? Nope. Because remember, there's one single bit, okay? This one single bit here, without changing anything else, the bit that is in blue is the only one bit that determines the sign of the number. Yes? Can you change the, what is the leading four to a C? That is correct, okay? In other words, if you change this four here, okay, let me use the mouse pointer. If you change this 4 to a C because you turn this 0 into a 1, then you have 1100. 1100 is a C in hexadecimal. So when I put this 4 here instead of a 4, and I put in, okay, let me, oh, okay, I just changed the page of the other one, but that's okay, we can fix that later. If I change the C to a 4, then I would have a 1 for the sign bit, which is bit 63. Then I go back to this notation here, and now I have negative 216.625. It's that simple. What if I want to double this value? What if I want to represent, okay, now I have to do some mental math. <coughs> what if I want to represent negative 432.25? Then what do I need to do? Okay, so getting back to the uh, tablet is probably a good idea, okay? So what do I need to change? What minor thing change do I need to make in order to represent twice of what I used to be representing? Hmm? We have to change the exponent, exactly, but how do we change the exponent? It has 11 bits, right? So which one, which one or ones do we change? I want to double the value being represented. So how do I change the exponent in order to do that? Okay, doubling means increasing one in terms of the exponent, right? So this is the exponent. We just have to add one to that portion. So that means whatever ends with you know, this one here, it now, now should end with a one. Does that make sense? That will increase the actual exponent by one, which means we're doubling the value. Is that okay? All right. So if if it's not a hundred percent, if you're not quite getting the concept, you can ask the question in class. You can ask me to pause so that you have more time to digest, or you can jot down some notes so that you can re-digest this portion of the lecture on your own. Okay. The, the option is yours. Okay. You know, you can just go ahead and you know, ask me a question. Like right now. Yep. Okay. Um, my original thought of doubling the value would be to change the 4 into 8 and then 0 and then 0 and then 6 is 12. But it's, you just said that all we need to do to increase the value, or I mean to double the value, is to add the 1 to the x. Yes. To this particular bit here, well, what I'm really trying to add is adding a 1 to these 11 bits. It, it just turns out that we have a zero here, so we don't have any carry. So we can just, when we add one, we just turn the zero into a one, and it's not triggering any carry to propagate through. So that's why we can just change this zero to one, which means we change this six to a seven. And that's it? That's it. Because what that is doing is it's changing the biased exponent by one. It's increasing 
the biased exponent by one, but that's also just you're know, increasing the unbiased exponent by one, which means we are multiplying the entire thing by two. One more time. Oh. Exactly. Yep. So, how, well, we since I claim that, I better be able to prove it. So now I go back here and I say, we'll change this particular six here to a seven and then reinterpret the bit pattern and we have the new interpretation. So it turns out my, my math was wrong because I forgot to carry the one from the 0.625 times two to this digit here. So I was wrong because of the uh, you know, arithmetic, but the concept is still applicable. All right. Any questions? Well, I have a question. <laughs> when when you when you use your C in okay to read in a double, how many people specify a double using the binary format? That you go through all this trouble to figure out what it's supposed to look like as a double, and then you type in the hexadecimal digits, and then reconvert it back into a double by interpreting it as a double. You don't do that, right? So what do you do? You type in the base 10 representation. In other words, okay, let me go back to my uh, tablet here. In other words, you go all the way back to the first slide, and what you do is... This is what you type into your program. And then somehow the compiler was able to look at this and convert it into the hexadecimal digit or the binary representation that we were working out earlier. So have you ever wondered how it gets the job done? No. Since it's the, it's, it's the compiler's job, so it's not my job, and therefore I do not have to worry about it. Well, that's not good enough for me. It's good. It may be good enough for a lot of people. Okay, I'm not saying that you know it. Everybody has to look at this, you know, with a microscope. But it's not good enough for me. Okay. So the next question is, how do we do that conversion ourselves? In other words, I give you something that looks like this, and then you write the code to convert it into something that's more like. The third slide, actually, where is it? The third, there we go. So you have to write the code to convert it into the hexadecimal 406B14 and so on. So here's the question. Why do you think this process is important? I mean, obviously, we have C compilers that can do that already. So why do we have to do it? Yep. Mm -hmm. And why is that important? If the compiler, if the computer can do something already, why do we have to know how to do it? So that if something like an error shows up, we can do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yep. Because that's one of the interesting things about chat and GPT is if chat GPT can do most of the things that people can do, why do we need human employees? That question directly relates to you, because most of you are looking forward to getting a bachelor's degree in computer science or computer engineering, and then get a job. So now you're, you have to convince your employer, your potential employer, to basically say, yeah, hire me, because I can do things that the chat GPT cannot do. So what do you think that is? I do not mean to depress you, but this is just a reality check. Can double check our work. You can double check not only your work, but the work that is generated or created by the tool. The tool may be just a compiler. The compilers are not really smart. I mean, they're really mechanical type of contraptions, but it can be AI, can be a lot of things. Your job is to be able to understand Okay, I see the output looks almost right, but is it right? But how do you check whether it is right or not? This, okay? So you have to understand how the computer is supposed to get it done so that you can cross-check to, to, to see whether the computer is correct or not. That is one of the few things 
that GPT cannot do is to cross check, you know, with a um, with critical thinking. How many people understand the term critical thinking? Okay, it is becoming more and more important. I have to say, you know, in my era, okay, you know, people of my era, when they graduated with a bachelor's degree, especially with a master's degree, they don't have to worry about getting a job. They only have to think about, so do I want to work for HP or do I want to work for IBM or do I want to work for Sun Microsystem or Silicon, uh, Silicon Valley Graphics and so on. Because at that time, okay, that's all you need. If you get a master's degree in computer science from San Francisco State University or any CSU or any UC, you'll be offered a job from multiple companies. Are we still in that kind of situation now? Nope. But you guys have heard that you know, in computer science, it's still in demand, right? You know, otherwise, you wouldn't be here. <laughs> but with that demand, there's still, I think, 4 or 5% of unemployment rate. How does that happen? It's a hot field. The employers like Open, uh, OpenAI, uh, Facebook, or you know, Meta, or X, you know, they're all trying to hire you know, people. How can we still end up with 5% of unemployment rate? Layoffs. Hmm? Layoffs. Layoffs, okay, but typically, you know, when there's still a demand, you know, after a layoff, you know, those people just have to work for somebody else. So why do we still have a 5% unemployment? Okay, the brutal answer is those 5% do not qualify to work anywhere. They have a degree, but they cannot get a job. So my job here is to make sure that you are not one of those 5%. Is that okay? I know it's kind of brutal, okay? But it's reality. I don't want to give you guys a sugar-coated reality so that you know, two years later you guys are like, that's not how I was told. <laughs> that would be bad. That would be like really bad because by the time you get to that point, you would have student loan already. And not being able to find a job after you get your student loan is not a good situation. Okay, so just want to make, make that point across. We still got five more minutes. So we can proceed to talk about some additional topics on this slide, or you guys can tell me what you want to talk about related to floating point number representation. Any specific, specific things? Because if not, I can move on to my notes to the next really fun part, which is in base 10 scientific notation, how do we express it in regular expression? This is the regular expression that basically specifies the syntax of a normalized base 10 scientific notation. All right, so right off the bat, we have one term that many, some of you may not know. What is a regular expression? You understand what is regular. You understand what is an expression. <laughs> but what is a regular expression? Expression is regular. <laughs> it is anything but regular. <laughs> All right. So first thing first, okay, you know, we look at regular expression. And you might say, but tech, this has nothing to do with you know, assembly language programming. And you will be correct. It really has nothing to do with assembly language programming. But it is useful as a tool to specify the syntax of a number in this case. OK, so I'm just going to read it off the screen here. Um, a regular expression is a pattern that the regular expression engine attempts, OK, that's not helping, to match in, in input text. A pattern consists of one or more characters, literals, operators, or constructs for a brief introduction, see blah, 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 blah. Okay. All right. That's not, it's still not helpful, right? So what I'll do is I'm going to give you a really quick rundown of how regular expression is applicable in our case. Okay. I have to go back to this slide here. There we go. Okay. So the way it applies to us, okay, is we specify a, 
base 10 scientific notation can start with an optional plus or minus sign. The square bracket specifies one of these things, okay? The backslash equal part is a quantifier. It specifies up to one of the previous things specified. So that means the sign, which is a plus or minus, is optional. You may or may not have one of those. And then we have square bracket again. So in this case, we are specifying a range of characters, and it only occurs you know, once. In this case, it's one to nine, because we want this to be a mantisa. So we do not want a zero to start the whole thing. And then we have backslash open paren versus a backslash close paren. That specifies a group. It specifies a group, you know, kind of like a folder. It's a container. And then inside the container, we have backslash and a dot, which is literally just the period, okay? The, the punctuation on your keyboard, the period. And then we have backslash D, which is, which is a classification. It specifies zero to nine, okay? The characters from zero to nine together is backslash D as a pattern. The asterisk here specifies any number of the previous thing. So that means any number of digits from zero to nine that is after a decimal point. This entire thing after the closing of the parentheses has its own backslash equal to, which means the entire group. This entire group here is also optional. You can have zero or one occurrence of this. Okay, and then after that, okay, I know we are, we may be running out of time, but not just yet. Then we have another group here. Okay, this, it opens from here, it closes here. This is an entire group. Inside the group, we have E, which is not optional in any way within the group. So E has to be lowercase e, you, you don't have an option. And then we have plus minus, you can choose one or the other, and the entire thing is optional. So you can have a plus or a minus, or you can have none of those two. And then we have digit from zero to nine again, and then this time, instead of an asterisk, we have backslash plus. An asterisk means any number of, including zero. Backslash plus means at least once. So that means we have to have at least one digit from zero to nine after the E if you specify that component. And then this entire group here is itself optional because we see a backslash equal to applied to the entire group here which means if you just want to specify 1.23, it is fine. You don't have to specify E0 in this case if you don't want to specify the exponent of 10. In other words, regular expression is a very ap apparently obscure way to specify syntax. It's a very simple syntax, okay? Some of you may take a class called automata or the theory of automata, in which case, you know, they would talk about all kinds of Turing machines and push down acceptor and finite state machines to parse, you know, input. Um, but I found that a lot of university have made that class optional. It is an like elective, which means many people do not have to take that particular class to get their bachelor's degree. So, but if you do take that class, this stuff is gonna come back. If you do any type of web programming, this part will come back because this is how we validate text input when you process a web form, okay? It's a zip code, okay? How do you check it's a zip code? It's a phone number, how do you check it is a phone number, okay? Regular expression is a very concise and precise way to specify Oh, it's a zip code, it has to have five digits and it, each one has to go from zero to nine. Or it's a social security number. How do you check the input is a valid social security number? Three digits followed by a dash, followed by two more digits, followed by a dash, followed by four more digits, okay? Now, do you need regular expression to, speci to specify all that? No, you can write your own code to do it. But this makes it much easier. Once you become proficient with regular expression, you know, you know, checking syntax, extracting information from text, and so on, becomes easy peasy. So that's why I want to give you the exposure of regular expression, just so that you know what it is. 
because you know it is something that is that sounds theoretical. It sounds like it's something that I probably do not need to know. But you probably do need to know it. So that's the end of today's lecture.、Um, I am going to switch to your lab today. Your lab today, I do have to mention a few things about the lab today before you guys go ahead and do it. It has to do with math, okay? Because you know this lab here is probably more math oriented than many of our other labs. So、uh, let me unhide it first so that you can at least get in. <clears throat> it has an access code as well. The access code for the lab is. Mantisa, so I'll write it on the whiteboard. Mantisa. Okay. Um. Right. Okay. So the first part is important because you know, it is giving you a reminder of the math that you might need to answer these questions.、Um, particularly, how do you use log? So if y equals to b to the power of x, then log b of y is x. Is that okay? And for y that is greater than zero, b is greater than one. You can also re-express it as x being the natural log of y divided by the natural log of b. So all calculators have natural log, but not every calculator has you know have has log of two. So that means if you want to find the log of two of something, you do the natural log of the original thing divided by the natural log of two, then the Result of the division is the answer. So,、um, just read the instruction carefully because you know, that can help save you a lot of time. Also, some of the questions ask for the closest representation to do something, which means the number can be over or under what you're estimating. So, don't just think about oh, it has to be under or it has to be over. It can be either way. So that means you, know, you kind of have to evaluate two options. Before you settle on, oh, this is the closest you know representation. So just keep that in mind as well. Other than that, I think you guys are ready for the lab. So it's already published. You can refresh your browser, get into the lab, and、uh, have at it. All right. So I'm gonna stop the recorder now.